IGM, the Ear Glue Media Network. You're listening to the Cantina Cast. Your home for thought provoking Star Wars talk. Join Adler and Jonesy in breaking down the latest news, trailers, movies, and of course, your favorite characters from a galaxy far, far away. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cantina Cast. My name is Albert Padilla, and this is episode 282 Dooku Jedi Lost. We are going to tackle the recently released Star Wars radio drama slash audiobook and kind of give you our insights and perspective on how things shook out as we listen to that. And joining me tonight, as always, is the latest member of The Lost 20, now The Lost 21. Please welcome Jonesy to the show. Jonesy, uh, can I start calling you Joe? Is it like for short? You can call me Al. call you Al or Pa. That's a Paul Simon song, by the way. You can call me Yeah, I know. That's a good song, too. Yeah. Uh, You'll get that reference a little bit later. (laughs) Yeah, we're old. If one, we're old. Two, uh, that reference will mean a lot more here in just a little bit. So let's get started with the news. And we've got a couple things here to talk about. A lot of Disney Park stuff. Uh, yeah. Galaxy's Edge, of course. And that had its big grand opening last week. And we were, I think, fortunate to have a number of folks that were either were uh, related, no, I shouldn't say related to, uh, acquainted with, I should say, either on social media or within Discord, that kind of thing. But uh, we've got some. Pretty good feedback from those from those folks, but uh, I think Chris, Johnny, uh, Ronald, do Katie. Well, I guess what's the overall? If you had to summarize some of the thoughts and impressions that they were that they were giving as they attended the park, how would you summarize? It that? sounds like the experience is great in a, in a word. Mm. I've I've really not heard any complaints, and which is really comforting, right? So first day, first weekend, usually you get a lot of the you know it rides down things like that. Things aren't going as smoothly, but. Sounds like this reservation system. I mean, it's still a reservation system, but it seems like it worked out pretty well. And yeah. people had their time in the park. It was busy, but it wasn't shoulder to shoulder crazy. And I think that seemed like it really worked. People were able to ride the ride at least once, maybe twice sometimes. And if they were able to get reservations, do the lightsabers and, and the droids and all that good stuff too. And a lot of really great videos online with the lightsabers and the holocrons and the droids. Oh my. And just all the different things you can do there. And not everybody was able to do everything right in your little, I think it was a four hour block, something like that. But it sounds so far so good. And I'm really, it got me really excited about this in Florida when we're there later this year and hopefully being able to experience it. Problem being Florida is probably not going to do this reservation system. They don't at least have any signs that they're going to, which means that it's a free for all. (laughs) <laughs> which is what they've mm-hmm. done in other ones. And that's pretty concerning about when is it going to be reasonable and your expectations have to be very, very measured if that's going to be the case. So we've been debating this a lot within the dance dad community because that's our thing. <laughs> and uh, yeah. if we don't hear anything by, you know, end of this month, June or beginning of July, then all likelihood, it's just going to be good luck, everyone. Right. As a, as a non Disney person, what has been your take on it though? I'm really curious how you're, viewing it and do you have any excitement as a result of some of the things that you're watching and seeing and hearing uh i would say yes but it it is pretty minimal i think I'm, i've tempered expectations quite a bit because i was expecting you know the worst and kind of to your point i've not really heard it and i haven't seen it and i don't know if that's because i mean part of me thinks there's a natural selection here right of people that have not gone and are not going to go for a while myself included and those that went kind of went in, they're probably like the diehard people. They're, you know, it's, it's very euphoric and they're a little, they're honestly probably more understanding than your average public. I'd like to see how this right. is, you know, a year later from now, right? When all of that's kind of settled in and the, the park has kind of found its feet and see where it kind of lands. But I think a lot of people went in with tempered expectations. Now that said, I agree. All the videos I've seen have been pretty cool. Like I've really enjoyed the lightsaber uh, videos there was uh, a number of a couple of them that put on the uh, the Sith and Jedi holocrons and you know that and the combining them all. Uh, I saw some of the footage of uh, Hondo, and I thought that was really cool. Uh, Star Wars show had it just recently. I think they did a live show from there as well. So I think I'm I'm I wouldn't say I'm excited. It'd be kind of cool to go, but I'm not really. It's still 
Yeah, it's in my purview, but not really necessarily something I'm planning for right now. If, you know, um, not quite. There, One of the things I was happy about were the, we, we talked about the lightsabers a couple of different times and concern about whether or not the build quality was going to be there to, to yeah. warrant a $200, you know, thing plus the experience and whatever else. And it looks like it is going to deliver on that price point. When you couple it with the experience, you get a bag. The lightsaber itself is mostly metal, except for the chamber. The chamber is plastic. These kyber crystals look really cool and they're interchangeable and they give you a yeah, different, and you get a different sound with it too, right? In addition to the different lights. And the holocrons have a similar experience as well, but I think that was really unique. You you have, I mean, yeah, they can monetize all this stuff, but you know, a kyber crystal that's 12 or $13 to go with yours to give it that extended value, I think is a really great move to where if you build one, you can continue to make it more yours over time without going and spending another $200 on it. And so yeah. I think that was a really good move. And I'm, I'm glad that the quality was there. And then you've still got the option if you want to do a, a cheaper lightsaber, not in quality, but the Legends, which are more the ones that we're already familiar with, right? So Luke Skywalker or Saifu, or not Saifu Dias, but uh, Dooku's lightsaber and <laughs> Kylo's yeah. and things like that. You know, I don't know why. Saifu Dias is on the brain lately, of course. Yeah. But so I was really happy that the value proposition isn't totally disproportionate to what we're going to spend monetarily. So I feel like they did find a pretty good balance right there. Yeah, I would agree. Um, it's looking pretty promising. And I did, that's an, uh, you brought up the aspect of the, uh, you know, buying the crystals and popping those in. And that's a way to kind of extend the life of that, you know, initial purchase, which is kind of neat for, for a minimal cost, right? Yeah. 12, $13 not a whole lot of money. I am not buying uh, that Kowaki and monkey lizard though. Cause I've got the Pandora. You say that now. I've got the Pandora know Banshee you, and it just sits in a box and I'm not going to do the same thing with that, that silly lizard. So mark my words. Well, we have, it's on record. <laughs> yeah. Now I do have to get a second and third job to pay for all the other crap we're going to have to buy. Right. But yeah. And the $25,000 droid that you can build. Thank you. Yeah. So it was, what's really funny because you said $25,000 like a week or two ago. And yeah. then that came out and it's like, well, that was just one thing, Albert. And you can customize it. Colors. Oh, and all wow. that. Yes, this is the wow. custom R2 yeah. droid. <laughs> oh, yes, please. Yeah. Father's Day, Give maybe. Maybe maybe Father's right. Day next year. I'll give the wife a little time. Father's life. I don't know about a day. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's talk about D3. Schedules release. Anaheim, August 23rd to 25th. And do you, do you get the sense we're going to get anything? Or I guess... What new stuff do you think we're going to get from Disney here with regards to Star Wars? Yeah, so this is Disney's D23 Expo. It's annual. What we, we, we had the schedule. So we know we're going to have an award ceremony. We're going to have Jim mm -hmm. Favreau and James Earl Jones are kind of the potential Star Warsy people. Favreau is probably for his Marvel things, but James Earl Jones seems like a shoe in for Vader stuff. But it looks like we're going to... Lion gonna, King too. Yeah, yeah, right. Lion King. There's a in Jungle Book. So a number mm -hmm. of different things uh, from a Legends Awards. He's he's developing a bit of a history now with with Disney. We're also going to get, and we, we speculated this before, but we're going to get more of a Disney Plus actual preview of the service, which I think is going to be a pretty interesting event. I, I don't want to say exciting because I don't want to oversell, you know, a preview of a piece of software, <laughs> but it sounds like we're going to get more of the Mandalorian. Although I'm a little hesitant to say more because... Quite honestly, I bet you we just officially get what we've already seen from Celebration back in April. And it, that's yeah, my guess, point. right? Yeah, I, and, and the geek in me really wants to see the UI. Like, I want to see how they came up with this. Oh, absolutely. How you navigate. Because I'm not really the biggest fan of the Disney now. Because it used to be Disney you know, TV. They had a, uh, was it Disney Channel? Then they had yeah, Disney uh, XD. and Disney XD. And then they consolidated all those into Disney Now. And that app, it's got a cool intro. I love it. Um, but sometimes it's a little flaky. I'm not really all that impressed with it. I have it, a love-hate relationship with that app. Yep. Yeah. I'm with you. So it is going to be interesting to see what that looks like. I'm, I'm really hoping it's a pretty slick and clean interface and gives us some some cool options that, uh, you know, we're expecting. Right. Uh, given Netflix, Netflix has kind of set this, the bar for all of that. Exactly. And so a couple other things you get into the Saturday and Sunday show. So that's all Friday, the previous one. On Saturday, they're going to have a behind the scenes and a sneak peek at some of the live action uh, Disney and Marvel, including the Star Wars project. So assuming this is more Mandalorian and potentially a little bit of 
sizzle reel stuff, possibly for Rise of Skywalker. I think that's a possible. They're also selling some exclusive guest appearances and uh, other types of things, you know, news and all of that. Again, tempering expectations a little bit. They do reserve some things for D23 that are special, but not really expecting anything super over the top. But I would expect a potential sizzle reel at either this event or and maybe again over at San Diego Comic-Con. And then we get into Sunday, of course, it's a Walt Disney World Resorts uh, update. But I think where this is a, maybe applicable to Star Wars is that they've, of course, announced that there's a Star Wars resort and it's possible we'll get a little bit more news about how that one's shaping up and maybe a little bit more, a few more tidbits about how that's going to work out against very early days. So I, I'm limiting expectations there a little bit from a very Star Wars centric. So that's kind of a rundown of what it looks like will be somewhat relatable to what we're interested in. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, I'm kind of hoping that we get some of the Cassian Andor stuff too, if if not a title or just something uh, from this, if they're going to be looking at uh, sneak peeks of live action Disney stuff. So. Yeah, and it's very possible they might expound a little bit on the uh, the scheduling that we had released a few or a handful of weeks ago with, uh, you know, the movies going out, you know, with Pandora and Star Wars in particular in, in, in oh, a few yeah, years yeah. from now. So, so that's right. possible we'll get a formal announcement of that or a more personal announcement to that and maybe a little bit of clarity about what the overall direction looks like again those projects are still a little ways away so eh, not really sure but again we, we have a lot of hope at this time of year in d23 they do cater to their really hardcore disney fans so hopefully they they treat them right and they they continue to make this a, a bit of a spectacle event like they sell it to be because it's not cheap to be at this thing right and there's a and what's funny is in social media there were a few people who said that they wish they would, they're planning to cancel their San Diego Comic-Con tickets because of this schedule for D23 related to Star Wars. Oh. That's probably a little overkill, but I can, I see their point that if they deliver on anything that we just talked about in any level of detail, what else could they possibly have for San Diego Comic-Con knowing that you're still five months removed from release of Skywalker or release of Rise of Skywalker. So I kind of see their point. No, yeah, I get it. And that's always been the case with Disney. Like they have their own expo and you you expect them like that should be their flagship and that's where their biggest news goes. And then that's not always the case. We get some pretty big news bombs on, you know, the different cons and that sort of thing. But yeah, it, if it's all the same content, then if that's really all you're there for, what's the point in going? There's a lot more to do at San Diego Comic-Con than right. Star Wars, but, but yeah, it's uh selective. <laughs> All right. The last thing we have is Star Wars Day at the Joliet Public Library. And so we were we're fortunate to have some really great supporters, uh, Patreon supporters at that with uh, Jeff and Stephanie. And both of them attended. I saw their pictures on Instagram. What a cool thing that this, this that they do. Uh, is this an annual thing that, event that they have, they have? It looks like it. And I know a couple other people that go as well. They're not listeners, but this is really cool. This is in Joliet, uh, Illinois, right? And mm -hmm. which is, I think, more or less a suburb of Chicago-ish, something like that. But man, they go all out. I mean, they have a parade. I mean, and it's a, it's an event. It's not just one of these little mom and pop small town things or a, a baseball, like actually, oddly enough, uh, today is June 7th that we're recording this and it's Star Wars Day with the Houston Astros. No, <laughs> so nice. I'm not there, unfortunately, but man, they do it right. They go nuts with this thing. And then they've got people in, they bring artists in, they, they man, they have the big tank from Rogue One was out there. It was incredible what they had. And you would think, you know, small town type of thing, not a huge deal, but wow. The, the pictures that, that Steph and Jeff were sharing with us were just kind of mind blowing of, of like, how big of an event this is and how really cool and how envious I was of why my town can't get its act together and, and well, have us you're in something. a small town. Yeah, yeah. But still to get that concentration of people <laughs> and love for the franchise and to do it all there in a huge contingent of 501st is just really impressive and really, really cool. And we, I just wanted to give them a little bit of airtime because that was an amazing event uh, to, to kind of watch from a distance and made me want to be there. Yeah, thank you both for sharing those uh, those pictures and, and your stories as well. We got some some great stories from both of them, I think, in Discord um, at one point or another. So, All right, well, that's going to do it for the news. We'll be back in just a second to hit the main topic, Dooku Jedi Lost. You're listening to an Ear Glue Media podcast. For more thought-provoking content, we invite you to visit eargluemedia.com. All right, we're back and let's talk about this. So 
Again, this is the long-awaited radio drama. And before we jump into that, just I'm going to go off script here because we didn't have it, but it's just something kind of we always we always do here with it. Um, before we even get into the synopsis, just kind of what were your overall impressions? Because in and I'll just set it real quick. I we went into this. We didn't get a lot of detail. I mean, there was that one audio clip that we listened to, and I think we commented on that at one of the shows early on. But I really went into this with no expectations whatsoever. In fact, they were I would just say that candidly, they were pretty low. I wasn't expecting this to be anything good because it, one, it was an audio. It was a audio book. And that's not a I'm not shunning audio books or, or sliding them in any way. But it was uh, audiobook only, I should say. It was a condensed audiobook at that. I think if this was a novel, it was probably somewhere in the 200, 300 pa- uh, page range, probably even less than that, actually. Uh, I think it was only six hours. Uh, we had a number of, we had a large cast, which I thought was was kind of cool. But just from the the pieces that we heard, there were some questions. And so all that going into it, I guess, what were your overall impressions with it from, from I guess, the the quality of the recordings and the story itself. Yeah, I think when you look at the production values, it really was pretty top notch. You had the it was what you expect from an audiobook for Star Wars. And in maybe even a slight step above what we normally get, a lot of ambient sounds, uh, sound effects, you know, the the voice actors of course were very much into it. It was very much radio drama compared with a narrator doing all of the different voices. So I like that that dynamic aspect to it, to where you have the differences, you have women playing women and men playing men and different ages, and you can Mm -hmm. tell the differences. So I think from that aspect, it was quite well done. It was well produced. I think we'll talk a little bit about maybe later, but some of the voices and some of the actors they selected for the voices might be a little jarring compared to what we're used to experiencing. And I think in particular, Dooku was, was one of the ones that probably is the most front and center with that. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I think we, I don't know if we shared the feedback on this on one of the shows or I think not. We alluded to it. We may have alluded to it. Yeah. So we'll, we'll come back to that. Though. Right. But the story, uh, but yeah, I would story agree. was good. Go I, I thought the story was pretty solid. Actually, the more I listened to it, because I had to listen to it two or three or four different times, and my daughter wanted to hear it. She's getting really into this stuff now. Not Star Wars, mm-hmm. but audiobooks in general, unfortunately. I don't know how that's working, but it was a it was a good story that I liked a little bit more every time because there were things you could continue to peel back. I think as Star Wars fans, those are the things that we appreciate when the authors, and especially with the connectivity it had with Master and Apprentice, there were a lot of things if you sat there and thought about it or you picked up on something the second time through and it was short enough to where you could actually do this. Listening to a 13-hour audiobook is a very different experience than six, six, six and a half, six or six and a half, right? right. So I liked that I kept picking up on things. And even if it was just a throwaway line, like the nameless, right? They talked, one of the, one of the prophecies we got a master apprentice talked about the nameless. So it was just this, these fun little things that were always present. And I think that helped bring the story alive. Even if there were moments in the story that maybe dragged or I cared less about like a Ramil type of character, but I think overall it, it more or less delivered it. We can talk a little bit about maybe, is this really uh an adult type of novel or drifting a little bit more towards young adult or something like that. But I think overall it wasn't bad and I love the radio drama concepts. I really hope that this isn't the last time we see something like this. How about you? Yeah. Well, so before we, I'll give you my just quick thoughts on that. Uh, The one question that I want to tackle at the very end that is really still kind of gnawing at me a little bit is what was the point of this book? And I don't mean that that's, I don't mean that in a negative way. I'm saying if you think about the context of this, uh, the story itself and the fact that it's a, it's Dooku of all people, not to you know, take anything away from him. I just really question why this came out, but more on that later. My overall thoughts is one, if you guys listen to the show, you know, I don't do audiobooks. books. Uh, I normally read the books and that's just a personal preference. There's nothing wrong with audiobooks, And so I really struggled. <laughs> I, I mean, I really, really struggled to, to take any kind of good notes with this, uh, and had a complete disaster with the notes, but that's another story for another time, maybe <laughs> on CAD. Um, but I, I really had a hard time, like trying to listen to it. And because, uh, I mean, I've listened to audiobooks in the past and I've enjoyed them, but it's usually on a car ride, right? The kids are in the back and we just want them to be quiet. So we throw an audiobook and that usually tends to to uh, calm them down. But I've never actually listened to an audiobook in, in this way before. 
And it was uh, it was a little difficult at times to kind of keep up, especially when you're trying to write notes and you've got to pause and rewind. There's a, a Blu-ray delay. It was just all very frustrating. So that experience itself from just for, for in preparation of the show was super frustrating. And I don't ever want to do that again. But overall, I'm with you. I think I, I really enjoyed the audio drama pre- the, uh, presentation of it. It was it was over the top at times. I will say that. But that is part of what it's like. I mean, if you think back to the old radio dramas of you know 30s and the 40s that's that's kind of what they were doing and that's kind of what we got with the original radio dramas from the uh, the first three movies uh so i i all i thought that was all great some of the voices um you know kind of blended at times so that was a little hard to to kind of you know separate who was talking from from time to time right but you know overall i thought it was it was pretty interesting and and i i'd i'd be all in on you know, actually getting an Audible account and signing up for this thing and, and listening to them. I don't know if I want to review them every time, but uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I just feel like they were kind of tipping their toe in the water with this, maybe a little bit, this this format and this media, just to say, hey, here's let's just see how things go. And uh, from what I recall, it went up to, it was in charting somewhere. I don't know if it's the top audiobooks or maybe it was on Audible only or something, whatever it was. I know at one point it got into the top five and I don't know if it got any further than that, but it seemed like it did all, all well and, and all, all things considered. So yep, pretty good stuff. All right. Well, let's, uh, can you give us a quick summary here? Let's, let's start with the summary of the novel and what we got out of it. And then we'll just start jumping into some of the characters and, and kind of speaking to them. Right. So we'll talk a little bit about what makes the story interesting for a summary rather than kind of going through the entire arc. So Asajj interest, this is early in her apprenticeship to count Dooku and she's tasked by her master to find his missing sister, Jenza of Sereno. So in order to aid in Ventress's quest, Dooku provides access to a series of clandestine recordings and personal journals between he and his sister that chronicle the milestones in his life from Jedi initiate to Padawan master. And then of course, his final act of leaving the order, which I think is the part that we were really most interested in, in digging into. Yeah. So throughout this, we learn about Dooku's relationship with his family, how he was cast out by his father to the Jedi as a baby, and then, of course, only to rediscover his family as an initiate. So he's in his early, I think, was it not quite a teenager, or right at a 13 years old, something like that, when he rediscovers his family. Yeah, the the book also, it provides a glimpse of his relationship with Sifo Dyas, which is another character that we have long speculated a lot about. And of course... What happens to Sifo-Dyas? So what, what is his descent into madness? You know, all these visions of the future and what does that actually look and sound like within the context of this story? We see mm-hmm. a lot more of the moral hypocrisy and the political corruptness of both the Republic and even the Jedi to an extent, which continues to amplify the frustration that Dooku feels with both of these you know, governing bodies, if you will. And as it kind of compares with his ultimate sense of duty and responsibility to both his sister and eventually Sereno as a as a the the planet and the people. But right. of course, throughout this, we start to see the dark tendencies uh, continue to surface. And as a result, when he gets or and then especially as he starts to get into a more mature state as a knight and even as a master, we start to see these things continue to pile up on one another. And we'll talk a little bit more about that soon. Mm-hmm. The story, and you know, we're exper- experiencing this really through Ventress and Dooku's eyes and through their lens, right? And while the story is going on, Ventress has her own struggle for her soul, which is taking place with this manifestation of Kyneric, her Jedi master after Halstead. We've talked a little bit about that in, in some other shows. He's plaguing her thoughts. There's a dialogue between them more or less through the entire book. And it provides us even some conflicting details about her past that we thought we knew and about maybe how altruistic or what even Kyneric circumstances were about his exile uh, back on rat attack. And so this culminates in the moment where she actually has to make a choice. So does she choose to obey Dooku's final dark order or does she choose to try to escape? But if yeah, she run away, literally, right? Yeah. yeah, literally run away, which I don't know if she would have been able to do anyway. But if she <laughs> makes this choice to align with Dooku, you know, it effectively would kill the light within eternally. Now we know a little bit that's yeah. not necessarily true with Dark Disciple, but that's kind of how this book is structured. So that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. That's the overarching themes and, and what we're expecting to see from the characters. Yeah, nicely done. Um, and we'll come back to the Asajj Ventress piece because oddly enough, that was the one, and I think I we were talking about this last night uh, when we had the false start, but I think uh, 
that was probably, a, for me, just as interesting as the Dooku story itself, right? Asajj's in, of interest uh, story here, especially when you take the whole context of her story arc and what we know with In Dark Disciple and everything. It's just really, wow. I mean, they need to get her, I, I don't know, it's too late now, but maybe it's not. But I would like to see more of her in some way. But anyways, uh, let's start with the main character, of course, who is Count Dooku. And so you touch on a, a number of things already about him uh, that we learned early on in the story. And some of these were kind of big bombshells for me, at least going into this, because it's just things you didn't really think about. Uh, you, you mentioned, you know, his father abandoned him in as an infant, literally an infant child. Uh, after he, w uh, you know, found Dooku to be force sensitive, this guy freaks out and doesn't want anything to do with it. And there's actually a reason for it, you know, early on. And don't get me wrong, abandoning a baby is is <laughs> not right under any circumstances, but you get the context a little bit later that he had the heebie-jeebies about the force. Uh, it, it, there's a, a whole backstory where the the planet's named Sereno because his great, 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 whatever grandfathers or uh, relatives fought off the Sith that it had kind of up or, uh, uh, came to, to power there on Sereno. And they didn't enlist the, the help of the Jedi at the time. They just took matters into their own hands and wiped these guys out. And so you get the sense that, okay, well, he was a little bit scared because now he has a baby, an infant that's for, that's force sensitive. And so what does he do? Well, he pitches it out, literally puts it out naked in the forest or something out there for like the wolf seed or whatever. Um, and eventually, you know, the, uh, he makes it, the Dooku is taken back to the Jedi order, but it was, it, that was kind of interesting that he would, his father would do that. And then you get this whole thing, the story with his sister, Jenza who is in close contact with her and literally up until, you know, he's a master. He is still in contact with her throughout his entire life. Uh, you also find out he's got a brother named Ramil. You mentioned him earlier. That's kind of, he's kind of a jerkwad, but uh, it, it, the idea that these Jedi and it's, it's nothing uh, we don't know, but the fact that the Jedi have these relationships in early on and here we have somebody like Dooku who went back to these relationships and kindled them and kept them and it's it played a lot into his the tragedy of Dooku too and, and we'll I want to come back to that in a little bit too because I think my perspective changed quite a bit honestly uh with Dooku I don't think I like him anymore as a good guy I don't I'm not saying that but you definitely kind of feel for him in parts and it it, it humanized him a lot more than I expected it to right there's uh let's talk about Jenza's connection though because this was an interesting aspect where they were had these data pads and they were kind of it was all kept in secrecy. And there there comes a point in the novel or in this audio I want to say novel because it's just habit. But there comes a part in the audiobook where uh, Yoda and, and the council and everybody find out that he's had close contact with her. And I guess one of the interesting aspects of this whole relationship is they don't do anything about it. Right. After they find out that he's had this relationship and that they're that he's continuing he tells him he's going to stop at one point. He's like, oh, you know, let me just do this last thing. And I promise I'll never talk to her again. And we, you know, it turns out that truly wasn't the case. But it's just interesting that the Jedi didn't intervene or do anything more when they found out. And they allowed him to continue to have that secret communication and those, and ex, you know, exchanging those data pads kind of uh, back and forth. But did you get a, anything there around the, the relationship anymore, I guess, with Jenza? Because it was a very loving and endearing relationship, too. And literally all the way up until like the last 30 minutes of this audiobook, you got the sense that he really sincerely cared for his sister and loved his sister. Uh, as as taboo as that may sound, he really did care for her. Yeah, it did. And it was it was interesting. You would think, especially after he had to come clean, there's some sort of like house arrest, right? <laughs> where you where you get yeah. checked up on a lot, make sure you're not doing the wrong things and even as a, I mean, he's still young, right? And then they call them younglings basically until they become knights effectively well, or something around that effect. But yeah, I think with, with Jenza, it was an interesting relationship because he even admits this. She has been his confidant. He can't, he doesn't feel like he relates to anybody else in the order. And he had that with Sifo-Dyas for a while, but even that started trailing off as they got older and they became more distant in their relationship. And we'll talk about that here in a minute, but I think, that was the one constant he had. He always felt different. He always felt unique. I mean, he was the grand, he was selected by the grand master to be a Padawan, you know? So by default, there's something special and unique about you and just didn't fit in. And we, we got a little of this with Qui-Gon as well at times from Master and Apprentice when he was young. 
And so it's, it's natural to see that this connection would be there. And also it was something that he never really felt before. The first time that they had the encounter, he felt something different about her, not necessarily about Ramil, but with her. And once they discovered that they were related, it all really snapped together and makes sense. And this, it was basically this kind of awakening for Dooku, this sense of longing that he really never had. He would have been better off never knowing this, to be honest with you. If he would have never known he had a family, his trajectory would have been totally, I think, probably totally different. Would he have still been frustrated in some things? Yes. But this concept of not being able to let go in kind of the same concepts we see with Anakin to an extent just wouldn't have been as problematic had he not been on this trip to Sereno. And they were, so the, the concept or the idea behind that was the Jedi were going out there for a demonstration, uh, again, trying to kind of connect the galaxy together a little bit, kind of one of those types of missions. Um, but yeah. yeah, but so it was his inability to kind of move on and, and uh, let go of that relationship. And quite honestly, it's a little surprising that the Jedi Council didn't make more of an effort to stop it unless they didn't think it was that big of a deal. No, I would agree. And and I, I know you mentioned Anakin, but what kept just gnawing in my mind the entire time was this whole relationship between Ray and Kylo Ren, because right. there there was it was very similar. There are a lot of parallels here. If if you get a chance, listen to it again and listen to it through to kind of that little lens. But if you think about the relationship between Kylo and Ren, Kylo Ren and Ray, it's very similar. Like he just couldn't let he you know, Kylo can't really let this whole relationship with Ray go. You got that sense from Dooku. It was the same way. Uh, you know, he, Dooku mentions that he was, you know, like you said, a loner. He didn't, you know, he struggled to make friends. He knew clans didn't work, that kind of thing. And you get the sense that that was probably the case with Kylo Ren as well. Um, you know, his, you could argue, well, I guess it's to be determined just how the trajectory of Kylo Ren's life goes or has changed now that he is, uh, you know, met up with Ray, not only in this Force Awakens, but especially with the relationship in The Last Jedi. And to your point, that house arrest piece of it, you know, I you think about somebody like Luke, who was like, no way, completely blew over, you know, blew down the house, so to speak, and demanded that that relationship stop. Whereas, you know, here was is quite the opposite. They allowed it to continue. So there was just things like that where I'm thinking, I wonder if these were all lessons that he learned from Yoda. And and, and maybe he's heard those stories about, you know, how um how for, far the off the beaten path or the the right path these things can take a Jedi or somebody who is following the light should they continue, and that's why he was so adamant that Ray and Kylo Ren not continue to to kind of have that relationship. So, but yeah, there was it was a it was a good aspect, and um, I, as a character, I, I didn't mind her so much. I, there she was in there, and I, she had it. She served the purpose. There was times when I felt like she was just you know, the damsel in distress, right? She was very, she seemed weak at times and I wish they would have made Rotor maybe a little bit stronger, but the fact that she was the one that gave Dooku strength was, was kind of a cool aspect. Um, he, 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 in fact, I think there was, I don't think I have written down here, uh, but there was a moment in there where he basically credits her when early on there's, um, they're down in like this, uh, they fall into like a cave, I guess. And the, there's a whole, the whole thing kind of starts coming down on them. Or is it the assembly? I think that they're in. Yeah, the Anyways, they're in. Right. Yeah, so the, it's starting to kind of all cave in because there's this new. There's a beast called a Terataka, and he touches it, and there's an earthquake and that kind of thing. And anyway, she pushes him out of the way and saves his life. And she's pinned down, and he's pinned down. And he makes a comment that in that moment, his whole life changed, and all everything, the good, the bad, at least at, at that moment, because he's doing these uh, recordings, he's really talking about the good. But all the the good things and, and everything that he has to live for, he credits her for saving her life, right? And that says a lot about his relationship with her. It says a lot about what he thinks about her. Uh, and it says a lot about why he decided to keep uh, such close bonds and, and close contact with her throughout uh, his life until, again, the tragic ending at the very end. Of and the she's the one that reached out to him, right? Which is yeah, yeah good point. not what he was used to. Someone that would want to do that. He was not... He didn't feel like he was in a position to say no because of all the things you just said due to the bravery of an 11 year old girl. So what, right. who is he to, to deny that? Right. Especially with the connection they had, it was just completely foreign and he had to pursue it. Yeah. There's um, let's talk about Saifa Diaz next, because this is a friendship that um, I mean, it's pretty cool to think that they were friends early on. Right. 
and and they even gave each other these these little BFF names. They <laughs> called them Dew and Psy, and this uh, you know harks back to the early the intro. But uh, but Duke was pretty clear up front that he did not want to be called Dew, although it continued on through the book. And I did I thought it was kind of neat. Some people were really mad about that, but <laughs> whatever. Um, but I thought the relationship seemed pretty sincere, even with like Duku's arrogance, right? Which we got a good sense of, like, you got a, you got a pretty good sense that this guy was very regal, not only in, in his, uh, fashion and form, but in his head, this guy thought he was above and beyond everyone else. And you could argue that he was, uh, maybe he was just kind of, you know, he was egotistical and over uh, arrogant and overconfident, but he could kind of. You know, walk the walk, if you will. Well, and uh, but even and in one moment, sorry to interrupt. In one moment, he actually had, he has a moment of frustration where he's talking to Sifodius, and where he learns about his heritage and the, the frustration about being found out of that. And he actually says, "I should be more. I should be better." And mm-hmm. Sifodius is taken aback by that and saying, "You don't really mean that." And yeah, he he backs off of it, but you can really tell that he does mean that. That yeah, he believes that. he does. I mean, he he knows that. He he has always been a notch or two above almost all of the people around or potentially everybody around him, aside from the masters. And when you learn that now you have royal heritage and you have this kind of responsibility and this this royal blood running through your veins, you can just imagine that that feeds the ego just that much more, right? To where when you make a comment like that, you absolutely believe it. Yeah, I, I, and there was, and and yet there were still times when, you know, they, but for, I guess we don't have any reason to believe that they were not just best friends. Um, I, at least in Sifadius's eyes, I think that was his best friend, and later on, it was probably his master because of you know all of the problems he was going through with the the Force visions and and all of that. But there were there were moments when, and there were Dooku was pretty sincere, especially when they were um, when they had a they were, uh, I guess, fighting for the masters to pick them as Padawans, uh, they end up getting picked together to fight one another. And Duke was still kind of like, Hey, you know, don't worry about it, man. Just put up your best fight. And don't, and even though in size eyes, he was like, forget it. There's no way I'm going to win. This sucks. You know, right. you're, you're going to kick my butt, that kind of thing. So it did seem like he was at least sincere with him, uh, throughout, which just makes his whole death even way more tragic than it really, uh, was before because, they are, they've got, they go through some stuff together, right? Right. Uh, Dooku and Sifadius, and they come out of it together. A, a lot of times they were there for one another. They've, you know, uh, sp- spilled blood together, that kind of thing. And, and yet, you know, we, we, it's, maybe it's just a testament to the power of the dark side, this, and obviously with Jenza, a testament to the power of the dark side and maybe the, the emperor's influence and what they ultimately, or what Dooku ultimately did to, to both of those as well. Well, you also, as they start to, grow apart throughout the book you can really feel and and get a sense for dooku's sense of loss that he has really and he he gets all the more integrated with jenza as a result because even his his best friend his his kind of partner in crime literally sometimes is all of a sudden not there or is withdrawn can't and they can't relate anymore even though they've still got this connection they still I think value each other's friendship and relationship, but you could just sense this loss that Dooku doesn't really have anything else. And when he and Jenza have a problem later on uh, after his mother's funeral, you could, you could really kind of sense his, his loneliness, his isolation of sorts, you know, and then start to cling on to other people like uh, Lean Kastana, uh, who was Saifo master. So it was interesting though. And I like that we got that sense of loss because it does give us other motivations later on for why Dooku takes the path that he does. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Lean Kostana next. She obviously is, well, I should tell, because we haven't really talked about her, but she's the Jedi master who eventually would take uh, sifo as her Padawan, even though uh, during that time, Dooku was really, really bent, hoping that she would pick him. And then he got stuck with, oh, just, you know, the grandmaster Yoda, <laughs> but he was really wanting her and she didn't pick him. Um, but interesting enough, she's, she's got a really cool background because she's really obsessed with the, uh, this idea of the prophecies and not only just studying the prophecies, but she's of this mind that we, there's something to learn here. There's something to prepare for. There's, there are advantages in studying this so that we don't fall victim to the tragedies and the errors of those generations past. 
And yet this is very contradictory. And we'll probably step on this a, a couple different times throughout the course of this conversation tonight. But there's uh, it's very contradictory to the aspects and or the opinions, I should say, of somebody like uh, Yoda. Right. He's got a totally different perspective on all of this. But more on that in just a second. So I thought that in itself was kind of cool. Um, I immediately thought of Yoda's quote in The Last Jedi, oddly enough, that we are what we grow beyond, because even though she wasn't his master, she kind of ignited that fire inside of him that would eventually get passed on to Rael, which eventually get passed on to Qui-Gon Jinn, right? And and so you've got these, this lineage, if you will, of, of four different Jedi that were obsessed with the prophecies, and this all kind of led, led up and culminates in the the chosen one prophecy in the events of episode one, Phantom Menace. Um, another interesting aspect of her really was about this whole obsession with learning from that past. And and throughout the book, there she's on the she along with uh, Dooku at one point, and then Cyphus Dias a little bit later. But they're on this path of like studying Sith artifacts and and going around and collecting on uh, collecting them, which is something we know Luke Skywalker to have done. So there's a part of me that wonders if he does this because. He came up with this strategy, him being Luke. Did Luke come up with that strategy? Or was this something that Yoda now encouraged him to do, given that, you know, he he comes to realize at the end of uh, Revenge of the Sith that he was wrong and that maybe there was merit and there was value in going out and finding these Sith artifacts and studying them and learning from them. And I'm just wondering if there was there's a story here where at some point after Yoda, Yoda passes on and, and, you know, the Emperor falls that it's Yoda that says, hey, you need to go out and get all these Sith artifacts. You need to go out and be an explorer, start studying all of this stuff, both the good and the bad. There is a reason for it, that kind of thing. And I'm just wondering if this kind of started back here, because you got to think Yoda, after this, after what we saw or heard, I should say, in this audio drama, you got to think he had some second thoughts about whether or not he made the right choices by not listening to the prophecies or adhering to them or studying the Sith and, and being prepared for their second coming. Well, or quite honestly, not listening to the other Jedi. Lin Kastana, yeah. yeah, her whole premise, like you said, her whole premise was that we need to be prepared for a Sith uprising. And Yoda's perspective was very frustrating, right? Because it was very much this kind of sweep it under the rug. Like they're, they're gone. We mm-hmm. don't need to dwell on that. We just need to live in and live in the present and, and plan for the future of our of our Jedi and of our order type of thing and really kind of stick your head in the sand with it. And that really frustrated her because you're right. She, it wasn't that she wanted to control anything and she seemed to actually have a fairly good grasp of this stuff, even though they were very much in the pursuit of dark side artifacts. And it sounds like they were coming into contact with either artifacts or something relatively frequently because of some of the rituals that we learned about and some of the cleansing that they had done from the, the Jedis of old. But it was this idea though, that, that we just need to be prepared and the other Jedi just don't want to hear it. And Yoda in particular just didn't want to hear it. And apparently they've had number, numerous arguments over this in the past. And she said she always lost, but I have a feeling it's just because Yoda has always just got this way of making it seem like less of a big deal. And you have, there's no proof, there's no evidence, there's none of that. Of course, we know that's how the Sith work. <laughs> and that right, just makes, yeah. right, we know that, you know, so it, it's like us kind of yelling at the radio saying, no, you know, this is going to happen. Don't, don't be so ignorant to this. But it was a, it was an interesting dynamic between them. And you're right with Dooku, somehow he get he gets kind of involved with this and he idolizes her a little bit. Of course, later on in life, we get some suggestive comments from Rail because Rail likes to be suggestive with things. Mm-hmm. And apparently he gets suggestive with Queen, so on Naboo, but whatever. Um, yeah. But this was a another just interesting dynamic of another person to influence Dooku along that path and, and really start to expose him to certain aspects and open his eyes, like you said, not only to the prophecies, but just to other events in the galaxy, like the cave you had talked about earlier. Yeah. Well, and there was, and just one last thing on her, I, and I think she was kind of like the entry point for him to the dark side, really. Because oh, yeah. and I, she I exposed think there's, him first, yeah, yeah, and and in a very physical way. Because when he first his very first encounter with her, she's almost egging him on, right, in, in trying to trying to get him to uh, confess that he had touched the dark side and that kind of thing. And he immediately senses the dark side inside of her, and so he pulls out his lightsaber and starts attacking her, and starts. He's convinced at that moment that she's a Sith because he's he feels something he's never felt 
this is supposedly a Jedi, and yet she's tainted with the dark side in some way. Uh, and of course, we come to find out that's really not the case. She's not a dark side character, but she is somebody who is steeped in the dark side history and the lore, the dogma, that kind of thing. She's a historian, a subject matter expert, <laughs> I guess, if you will. And that comes and he's not able to kind of distinguish that between, you know, what is uh, the dark side? He just knows that it's there. It's a dark presence. And so he attacks her. But yeah, what a, and, and from that moment, you got to think that that was enough to really kind of spark the interest, at least in the dark side, which would eventually lead him, lead him down the path of of turning on the Jedi uh, Council uh, independently of that, then becoming the uh, the Sith Lord that we knew he would become later, a little bit later. Yeah, the life. symbolism of the beast within, as he, he was exposed to the Terrataka, and then, again, everything he thought he was sensing in her was really coming from within. And that becomes a theme throughout the novel, all the way through the end, where we have the, the climactic battle, if you will. Right. And so we got the, uh, we made, made mention that uh, Yoda is one who eventually picks him up. We, of course, we knew that going into this, but the, Yoda was uh, ultimately his, uh, his master. Um, and they mentioned that it was a rare honor. Um, I think we got some context of that as to why. And I think it's really just kind of stems to the fact that you got a lot of role, you got a lot of responsibilities and very little, little time to actually take a paddle on once you make it to the Jedi Council. I think we learned that in Master and Apprentice. And to think that the Grandmaster himself would choose somebody even kind of speaks to just how powerful Dooku is and just how interested uh, Yoda was in trying to shape and mold that power, that raw power, uh, which, again, did a poor, piss poor job of it. But, you know, that's Yoda. Well, yeah. Dooku said it himself. He didn't want to be shaped. Right. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, right out of the, uh, that was in the audiobook. Right. I, I really um, liked how they began the training, though. This was a this is really gives you an idea of where Dooku was going into this event where they decided they had some delays in starting their training. Um, Yoda had a lot of work, like you were saying, he, the grandmaster is very busy. So they finally do this in the gardens. Right. And over the course of a month, Dooku keeps coming back to Yoda and Yoda just sits there sometimes levitating eyes closed, complete meditation. And Dooku is just trying to prove his worth in a variety of different ways. And until at, at right around this month, he tries to uproot the force tree and unable to do it. He finally just has a complete breakdown and opens himself up that he doesn't know everything. And of course, Yoda's line back to him is always fantastic, you know, ready to learn the things that you don't already know. And uh, of course, Dooku is just one of the things we can always say about Dooku is he has this unquenchable thirst for knowledge and information and I think he understands knowledge is power in a lot of cases, but we, we finally, you get that eagerness, even with him kind of being laying bare, you still get this eagerness and this enthusiasm to learn. And the way that the voice acting came across though, seemed a little over enthusiastic, not from an uh, overacting, but just a, what's your real motive for that? Or is it, or is it still this excitement, you know, craving this excitement and then learning all of this, or is it truly just, I'm just exasperated and please teach me. I just need to know. Yeah. I, there was, I like this, the, the tree part I liked the, I will say that I don't know that I was the biggest fan of this 30 days thing. And this is not a, this store, that particular story is not uncommon. Like I've, I, I can think of three or four examples, sure. uh, one of which is Steven Seagal, by, of, of, oddly <laughs> enough, uh, where he went through the same thing and, you know, went out to the dojo in Japan and waited and, you know, the master wouldn't let him in. You see it in the old um, the Chinese martial arts movies where the master refuses to train him. But it didn't. It, the problem I had with it is, is just I don't understand the purpose of why Yoda was doing this. Like you get with the tree and, and all of that. And, and there was there was a lesson there. But I had a hard time really reconciling the fact that they went 30 days and he never they never had a conversation. And this wasn't in they, they never said this in the novel, but I, I, I just can't imagine that they didn't have a this didn't come up or other Jedi were asking, what's the deal with Dooku? Because he's got to be after day three. You got to think he's pretty upset about this and he's talking to people or asking other people and that kind of thing. But it just felt like it was too long. I don't know if 30 days was, was really the right thing, but I may be just harping on a, a stupid minor thing, really. No, I, I mean, I think there's something to that. Again, we, we talk about this a number of times. The Jedi don't seem to know how to communicate very well. 
Well, and that's my point. It's like, dang, Yoda, really? You're going to do this now? Well, you got the your grand pick and this is what you <laughs> Exactly. But I think uh, to an extent, I do understand it, though, of you have to be ready to open yourself. We talked a little bit about this last week with visions and prophecies, right? You have to be ready to open yourself up to learning or to experiencing what it is you need to experience and what you need and what someone wants to teach you. If you go into it already thinking, you know, 80, 90 or more than the person that you intend to learn from, then it's just, it's going to fall flat. It's not going to work out for you. So yeah, was 30 days too long? Should he have set some expectations? Maybe, you know, how we corporate this stuff to death, maybe is our perspective on a little bit. But I think from a, are you ready to hear what I have to say? fundamentally ready to know that you don't and just to have this humility i think is what duke or what uh, yoda realized that dooku needed he needed this humility moment to where he is just completely laid bare and has nothing except be able to listen and learn from there and then his trajectory is going to go through the roof and it sounds like it did sounds like it more or less worked yeah let's talk about um there's a moment in here where they go to is it proto branch right yeah, our first um, real hit on a vision. Yeah, talk about talk more about that. Right. One. Yeah. So Sifidia starts to experience visions, and this is where we start to understand a little bit about what we speculated with Sifidia over the course of our other content. Mm-hmm. And so he he starts to witness the uh, the basically the destruction of this planet. There's fire. There's casualties. It's just a broad scale, and it's and it it impacts his very core. I mean, he starts to you kind of see the fractures starting right. So they go to the Jedi Council and admit to that he, he's doing this or that he's having this. And of course, we, we, we get the hypocrisy start to float back in where we're not really sure we believe you. you know, and visions, you, know, you start to get this idea that there's something wrong with people who have visions and that, that maybe, and we kind of see it, we sense it with the prophecies as well. If we could just explore the prophecies, Lean Kasana says, and it gets shut down right away. But to the Jedi's credit, we start to see them come around in order to identify what it is. But even when they start to identify and they can all start to experience it, they don't want to go help. They don't want to get involved with the affairs. They, things will happen. You know, the will of the force is the will of the force. We're just here to, you know, carry out its will. And if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. We also see it with the Republic. The only reason why Proto Branch is really important to its Senator is because if it's, it's a agro world and its primary export is Bacta. And yep. they, they view that the, the millions of lives on the planet is, n- this is the Republic, not the Jedi. They value the lives of everyone in the Republic over the millions of lives that might lose their life on that planet. Now, this is a temperature control, uh, control planet. You know, they, they don't have any scheduled things. And what we find out later on, of course, when we get there, because of course we have a secret mission, right? Is a solar flare is the cause of this. And all of these floating cities, they've moved all the people up to these floating cities and it, of course, destroys the, uh, the the technology. It fries. You get this magnetic pulse, right? It fries everything. And everything starts plummeting back to the planet and destroy it, fire, all of that good stuff. Yeah. When this when this was kind of, as I was listening, uh, I started thinking, oh, they must. he's having a vision of Alderaan. And I was like, oh, wait, no, that's probably too far away. And then I, then I saw, well, maybe it's, you know, Hazian Prime. And he's really seen that far but really, the whole purpose of this was what just to kind of foreshadow what was was to come a little bit later when Dooku's own planet of Sereno was under attack. And again, Jedi didn't want to get involved. And again, the Republic didn't want to get involved. And so this was just kind of another that was another instance. And that was kind of the, the camel that, that broke the, the straw that broke the camel's back almost to some extent. Um, and that's kind of why this was this whole story or at least this little what piece was in there, but it does show a lot of hypocrisy here with, with the, both the council and the Jedi. And it's, and I don't, what I, what I get frustrated with is the lack of consist, consistency. Like there are some things that we know from star Wars where they go out and they will send a ton of people to go help and, and fight and do right and do good. And then other times like this, they're like, yeah, sorry. You know, we can't, we can't save everybody. Although we just, you know, saved the two people on this one mission we're not going to, and I'm, I'm talking about the Clone Wars. You saw that a lot in the Clone Wars where there's kind of small missions and they may have, may or may not have had bigger, larger ramifications in, in the whole grand scheme of the Star Wars storyline. Uh, but yet they would dispatch the Jedi out there to help or dispatch the a clone. Uh, well, they had the clones at that point, but 
they would send out, you know, these armies of people to go out and help. And yet here in this time and, and age, they couldn't. So I don't know, maybe it was a resource thing, uh, but it just seems like there was not a lot of con- consistency here in terms of when they decided to, to jump in and help and be peacekeepers and when they chose not to. I think that's a great point to talk through because the Jedi, you're right, they do have limited resources. And Dooku, when he speaks to the Senate as a master, when he's sitting on the council, he very much says that, you know, there's not enough Jedi to go around. We need the Republic to listen to us and to take heed and to help in these other areas and not reduce or, or not limit. But I think it's also how integrated the Jedi are with the Chancellor and with the Senate. And we, uh, Yoda, on a number of occasions, went and said, I'll talk to the Chancellor, I'll talk to the Chancellor. Well, when did the Jedi need to go get permission for everything? And we've heard this in a couple of different mediums yeah. throughout the yeah. last couple of years, right? Of why does the Jedi have to have permission from the, the Counselor? And when we get this, we had this with Legends too, as Luke Skywalker and the Jedi Order as well, and trying to go back to this listening to the Force type of thing, rather than the political side of, of the Jedi Order and the Jedi Council in particular. So it's a, you're right, it is very frustrating to have this because the Jedi aren't able to, I have a little bit of empathy here for them because I'm sure they want to help, but they're just not always able to, and you have to draw a line somewhere. And, but you're right. When do you do it? And how do you draw that line? And you can't save everybody type of thing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But again, how do you, some of this is like, what's right and wrong sometimes. And that's where I kept coming back to is like, some of these things just boil down to a moral decision. And I get a moral decision is very personal, but the Jedi code and the, or what they're, they're trying to aspire to at the very least seems like you have pretty clear lines of right and wrong sometimes. And we're not doing always the right thing by the, by the people across the galaxy. And one of the things I liked was you have this sense of from Dooku about, you know, again, getting to the people, the people on the ground. We talked about this with Qui-Gon's view of the council. When if you were to join kind of looking forward, you know, I, we need to get back to our roots, get back to this blue collar mentality of serving the people rather than maybe serving the Republic. Yep. That's a good point. Um, definitely see that, uh, that, that theme kind of uh, repeats itself in, both in canon and legends. I was just thinking about some of those instances. There's a, let's talk about one other, um, I guess maybe the final thing with in when he's still in his Padawan age, and this is kind of a pivotal thing. I think there's a lot to pull from here. Uh, steeped in a lot of lore for sure but there's a moment when they are in search of these um i guess they're i don't know they're bandits or they're selling nerve disruptors um these thugs i guess and they've tracked them down to a planet called the susto I say that right i forget yep. that's the right name yeah so they track them down to this planet called the susto and it's there um that they finally track these guys down it looks like they're waiting to kind of you know, make this exchange where somebody's buying these nerve disruptors. And there's a moment in there where Dooku decides to kind of take matters into his own hands. And he goes all Anakin and the sand people on him, right? He goes and just goes and slaughters all of them. And you got, uh, even when they were approaching the planet, they all got a sense that the, that the, somehow there was the dark side was, uh, was here in some way. And, and later on, we find out that this place is really like, just tainted with the dark side. In fact, I think we the the quote from the the audiobook says it's a nexus point and a source for all change, right. which was interesting. Um, but it's it's right after that that they're um, and I'll, I'm just going to kind of summarize because we're kind of running along here. But it's after that fight happens, they are uh, I guess captured um, and by a witch. Uh, this and we can talk about her in just a second. Um, but w- What's more interesting in this moment is that there's a vision that that occurs and Dooku has this crazy vision of seeing all kinds of things. And this was a really interesting piece from from the, the, the production quality of it, because there were a lot of voices that were going on in this vision. And, and we see the visions a lot. We've talked about them a lot from the Darth Vader comics and the Qui-Gon Jinn comic. Uh, you know, we've we've talked about the visions that we saw, like in the Clone Wars and obviously like Force Awakens, Last Jedi, that kind of thing. But this is the first time where we that someone, I think, tried to do like a true audio uh, vision. And I just want to talk about the technical piece of it. And we can come back to the story because that's probably the more interesting thing here. But this was a, I had mixed mixed feelings here. There were times when I could, I could hear what was going on. And then there were other times when I I really couldn't. And maybe that was the point. 
But this is where I found myself rewinding and playing, rewinding and playing and trying to hear and trying to understand what was going on. And I guess the gist of it I got was the big thing, the big takeaway here was he hears Order 66 at some point, right? He sees and hears the the events of Order 66 and Palpatine and Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi and all of that. But just from a technical uh, aspect, did you uh, how did you feel about that? That Because it was a pretty long segment, too. It wasn't just, you know, a quick one or two seconds. This thing drew on for almost 30 seconds. Yeah, it was. And you're right. At first, I was frustrated by it because I was trying to hear these things and you'd hear Palpatine and you'd you'd hear things that were familiar and then you'd hear things that weren't familiar. Right. But when I thought about it more and more, part of me, I, I think it was, that was the point. It's supposed to be, give you as the listener, this idea that, hey, how do you make sense of this? And then how crazy would that drive you? Not only if you were experiencing it firsthand and your head is just this mess of things and you got this moss all over you too, but what if you had to, if you were just trying to interpret it and trying to understand it? And so I, I thought that did a good job of that by running it over and, and blending some of those, uh, some of the words and some of the phrasing and, and whatever else was being said and it not making sense because you just really can't do it. And you think you hear one thing, but maybe it's really something else and it can really drive you a little batty. And I thought that was a, I thought that was actually delivered pretty well. If you, when I looked at it from that perspective, mm. uh, I'm going to go on a, a limb and say that was maybe the point or something to that effect. But that's how I chose to look at it. And I think it, yeah. it delivered if you, you know, from that way of thinking. Yeah. Um, this planet, we, we talked about the moss. It, they mentioned that it's a moving moss and it, it, it negates your force powers, uh, which kind of plays into something in just a second here. But um, you had this question. We were talking about this last night about whether or not this was the same planet that we saw in the Age of Republic Qui-Gon Jinn comic book that we covered. And you and I were on the same page, but you had a, you had a more interesting aspect and I don't want to say your thunder so you can take it away, but you had an interesting uh, aspect here about uh, the planet itself. I'm trying to remember what that was now. <laughs> All right. Let me fill you in. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No, you had said that uh, the Moss was calling Qui-Gon Jinn. Was it calling Qui-Gon Jinn because it had already called oh, yeah. its master in. Uh, yeah, there was a connection between them. And so, yeah, why would it, why wouldn't it? Yeah, And something to come back and phrase that was the. Uh, the queen or the whatever the the thing was that was talking to them called the uh, Dooku a conduit, and yeah. I think we could agree. And Dooku says this about Qui Gon later on that Qui Gon has a connection to the Living Force as uh, as strong as anybody he's ever known, and he believes will probably exceed Yoda's at some point. If you take that, you could probably transcribe or kind of port. Qui-Gon in that Qui-Gon might be a conduit to some extent as well. And I think if you were to draw that line of, yeah, why would the planet call out to him? There may have been something else there that they sensed the connection with Dooku and another opportunity. Yeah. Uh, I like that. That's a, a good theory. The, um, presager of, uh, Hakate, 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 something like that. Hakate. Yep. That's it. Uh, presagers of Hakote. That was the, she was, I guess she was, a, I'm just going to call her a witch, but that's what she, that was her little coven, I guess, if you will, that, so they were, uh, the moss kind of consumes them. They wake up and they're still kind of bound by the moss and they can't move and that kind of thing. And she's kind of going on this little monologue, uh, of, you know, what they're doing. And basically they sat, that's, they're kind of like these dark magic, uh, almost kind of like the night sisters, uh, to some extent. And they are obsessed in seeing the future, uh, visions and prophecies. And the way they come about their visions and prophecies is through sacrifice. And I think they mentioned that they've sacrificed hundreds, if not thousands of people right. in order to, to see this. And, and she was about to make these three, her next three sacrifices in order to uh, kind of see the future and, uh, you know, benefit from that in, in some way. We never know. Um but it was interesting uh, because it, there was uh, there was a moment in there where they initiated this whole ritual of the three. Um, so Sifo-Dyas is, I think, kind of completely lost his mind um, in all of this. And there's a we, I wrote it down. They start going into this little chant. Right. And it's a way to kind of cleanse the dark side that they've been tainted with at some point here. Uh, but he says we call upon the three light, dark and balanced true. One is no greater than the others. Together they unite, restore, center, and renew. We walk into the night, acknowledge the dark, and find balance in ourselves, for the force is strong. 
was kind of neat. Like there was a lot of this was a very different take on the force um, and, and more than just the Night Sisters, because, again, they do dabble in the magical aspects of the force. But there was something really interesting here because we were seeing it from the Jedi almost. Right. right. And this whole idea that they and I, I mentioned this, but let me just touch on it hit it a little bit harder. They wrap themselves up in these like claws or these uh what did they call balm them? of the luminous balm of the luminous thank you yeah they put these wraps around their arms and i thought of like ray because i think she's got them on and there's probably some other characters that are eluding me now that have, have worn something very similar but they wrap their arms up in these things and they start talking about them and the thing that really interested me here is um that kastana mentions that the ancient jedi used to use this almost daily as, as part of a ritual and they would do this whenever they had been touched by the dark side or tainted with the dark side in some way as a way to cleanse them. And this is very similar to uh, a communion in Christianity where, you know, once a week you go to church and you accept the body and blood of Christ and you're, you know, you're cleansed and you're absolved of your sin. And from just a personal perspective, what that allows you to do is it allows you to just to kind of have a clean slate and not kind of feel like you're weighted down by the guilt and the shame and and, you know, the negativity of, of your past sins or the things that you did wrong. And I just thought that was a really cool aspect that, the, that, that this is something that the Jedi used to implore, but have since, you know, strayed away from it and don't do it anymore. And I just wonder if because they're not doing it anymore, are they more susceptible to falling into the dark side? Or is, is, this, is this one of the things that is because they've gone away from doing this ritual and gone away from some of these uh, ancient rituals like this? Has the Je- have the Jedi completely? Is this when we talk about they've lost their way that they don't do that anymore and they go the path of somebody like Yoda, which is to just bury your head in the sand, meditate, and pretend nothing ever happened? Kind of thing. I think some of it. The question I have is that why were they doing it back in the the Jedi of old? Like what was what were they doing that made it feel necessary, or was it just a standard ritual? Was this just a daily activity or a weekly activity or you know, some sort of regular cycle to where this was just part of a, you know, like a prayer type of thing, right? Of where you, you get into this daily routine or some established routine. Or yeah. were they really trying to cleanse themselves of something? And you're yeah, right. Because Kas- I- had the, had made that point, though, of we've, we've forgotten so many things that, yeah. the, that the Jedi of old have left us and taught us. And why, you know, why shouldn't we do it? Of course, Dooku has an interesting reaction to it. I think you and I probably had the same one was, this is witchcraft. <laughs> right you're, you're right, wrapping yeah. you're wrapping yourself with something and you're chanting there was a lot of chanting in this book you know of these things that like what what are we doing this is sorcery this isn't yeah. this isn't a jedi's values but again you start to see the differences of the modern versus the you know versus the ancient the ancient yeah yeah and that's kind of where i was ch- i chalked it up to is so, okay they maybe just back then thousand years ago they simply acknowledge the fact that we're human or humanistic in some way we we or we are with sin we're going to make mistakes we're not perfect and we are going to have moments of weakness and through at least this ritual uh they believe that they were able to kind of have a fresh start learn from their mistakes and get right back on it and 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 acknowledge it rather than burying it or suppressing it and not talking about it right not acknowledging it in any way just meditate and don't worry about it everything's fine here's your next mission kind of thing and i think that's and I think that's that's probably true because after all of this is done, uh, she tells Dooku that they need to don't tell Yoda. I mean, she asks him not to tell Yoda. Please don't tell Yoda we did this thing. Um, so it sounds like it is pretty taboo. Um, and there's probably more to it, right? We're probably oversimplifying some of the new more the nuances here over a, a, the course of about a thousand years. But but yeah, that's that's kind of my take on it, I guess. Um. All right, let's talk about um. He's now a master and he decides it, that he's going to take his Padawan and he picks none other than Rail, uh, which we I don't think we got to see that part of it. But we did get to see uh, a lot of him with Qui-Gon Jinn as his Padawan. And before we get into that piece of it, we were joking about this last night in, in Qui-Gon Jinn's, uh, what did we call her? How did, <laughs> he's a little more spirited. Yeah, let's go away. Then I th- <laughs> than I think we've had in the past. He was not near as pensive, I think, is what we've gotten used to portraying or how Qui-Gon's usually portrayed. But yeah, he was very eager, very enthusiastic about many things, especially gambling, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Or, or dealing the, with uh, politicians. I, I don't, yeah, it was a very different Qui-Gon character than we were used to experiencing. 
And I, and I think I, I, I'm just, innocently enough. I think they were just trying to play up on the fact that he was a young and he was a kid and right. Right. Very different person. Uh, there was a moment in there where he yelled accidents will happen. And it reminded me of a yippee <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. That quote. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was cool. I guess it was fine. It was, it was a little harmless. too Obi-Wan for me, actually. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Obi-Wan is usually the one delivering those lines, but this time it was Qui-Gon fulfilling that responsibility. Um, can you talk about the, uh, you you brought up this great parallel where between master and apprentice and this one where the master walks in and the apprentice and the apprentice walks in and the master. Right. Yeah. And master and apprentice, we had Qui-Gon studying in Dooku's apartment. And I think at one point he was studying the, the prophecy or had the Holocaust prophecy. He was doing his book report. Right. And Dooku comes in and really gives him a hard time. You know, what are you doing? What are you doing? Well, in Jedi Lost, we have Dooku doing something. Right. And he was, he had the, again, he had the balm of the luminous on and he was chanting and Qui-Gon comes into his room and kind of busts him doing this type of thing. But it was interesting, just kind of mirroring of activities here, mm-hmm. but it also started to give us like, what are you doing, Dooku? Like, what are you doing behind the scenes? And, and they don't really explore that a whole lot, but this was a great, uh, very uh, synergistic moment between the books where Clearly, Dooku is doing things outside of his teachings with Qui-Gon. And we got a flavor of that from Master and Apprentice a little bit. But here we actually see it. And we see the side effect of that and him needing to cleanse himself because you can already, the only reason why you're doing that is to get centered. And the way they positioned it in this book was that you're only doing that if you need to cleanse the dark side and then kind of wash that off. There is a, a moment here with, uh, let's talk about, I guess, um, who is it? Uh, Ramil's crash. Right. Um, and where he begins to kind of flirt with the dark side. And, and it's really when he becomes, a, I guess it's probably safe to say once he becomes a master, this is where it's just a succession of like different events that are happening kind of to your point where you get a sense that he is just edging ever so closely to, to kind of crossing that line. And so, and it kind of makes it just, you know, makes him prime for the picking uh, with Palpatine um, a little bit later. Um, there is a, can, I just want to talk about Palpatine just very quickly here. There was a one part in this book that was uh, really cool in that we come to find out that it's actually Rail who introduces Dooku to Palpatine. And I forget where they are, what planet they're on at, at, at in this point in the, in the novel. I think they were on Coruscant about to leave. Yeah. And he, he's, he's like, Hey, I want you to come meet somebody. And um, we get Palpatine come out there and then he starts talking to him, but it's, it's just kind of interesting that it, it of all things, that's how they they were connected, um, given it was one of his former uh, Padawans himself. Well, it makes you wonder if Palpatine was looking at Rail as maybe filling a need. Because yeah. it seems like they had a relationship over several months and Palpatine was giving him advice. And we didn't get much more than that, but you kind of, you get that sense with Rail. He's a bit of a, a little bit of a rebel, a little bit of a rogue. And Palpatine's got his feelers out there. Who's going to fill these needs for me? Right. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder, did we talk about that on Master and Apprentice? I don't think we did. Um, but anyways, um, where are we here? The uh, Oh, so we get to, let's jump a little bit for, further ahead here, just in the interest of time, and kind of talk about towards the very end of the novel, really, where there's a, suddenly a crisis on um, Sereno. And there, we come to find out, I think it's pirates that have invaded uh, more pirates. There's been a lot of pirates here lately in, in Star Wars <laughs> there have stories. Um, but yeah, we've got some pirates that have invaded Sereno. He goes and petitions to both the council and the Republicans like, hey, you know, we need some help. And they basically say, no, sorry, we're not going to interfere. We're not going to intervene. And so he just takes it upon himself. He enlists himself, uh, Sifo-Dyas and um, Lean. Lean. Thank you. And they all decide to go out there. And, and, and this is all coming from a distress signal, I think, from uh, what's her name? Jenza. Yep. Jenza, thank you. We'd be great on the $25,000 pyramid, by the way. <laughs> 25000 uh, droid pyramid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Holocron pyramid. Uh, Twenty. The uh, Jenza uh, puts out a distress signal and, and calls her out there. And so they end up showing up there and uh, they crash their ship, which I thought was hilarious. That's like one of the better moments. Uh, they crash their ship on on the planet. And they eventually make their way uh, over there and and obviously save her. Uh, but there's a moment in here where this whole Tirataka beast 
comes back and and we kind of skipped over this, but there are other aspects of the book where he's learning to uh, influence animals or control animals, I guess, depending on how you want to look at it. And he invokes that power in order to kind of take over this beast called the Terataka and uses that to pretty much, you know, lay waste to all of these guys and then kind of uh, kind of even the odds, if you will. Uh, but it's through all of that that, you know, he really in this whole this whole scene where he's basically defending Sereno, uh, he really touches the dark side and really it gets it gets uh, more exposed here uh, more than ever. And the the crux of all this is the fact that his brother is the one that's behind this whole thing. Like his brother is the one that allowed the pirates to come in so that, you know, he could, you know, uh, rally the forces and, you know, be victorious and and come out on, uh, ahead. And after, you know. Count Dooku finds out that that was the case, uh, ends up killing his brother. So. Yeah, and to get there, yeah, a couple of things. So one, the council seemed a little bit irritated with Dooku. Jenza asked for your help, Dooku. She didn't ask for the Jedi help. She asked for your help. And that was very pointed as well. And the thing with the Tirataka, though, was that this was the sins of the past. He was repeating what, I won't call him his ancestors, but the, you know, before the planet was named Sereno, they were using the Tirataka, the enemies that his family repelled. They were using the Tirataka, the Sith were, and they were controlling it. They were basically torturing it, forcing it, bending it to its will in order to wreak havoc. And when it went into its sleep, you know, it was kind of at peace. When Dooku is touching the mind, you know, he's promising it. I'm, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to do anything. Don't worry, stay calm. And then Lin Castano is doing some of the same things, trying to keep it calm while Dooku's trying to handle business up on the surface. But at the end of the day, Dooku finally loses it and complete control over the beast and just starts laying waste to everybody mm -hmm. while he's up dealing with Ramil. And we get the same lightning that's coming from the beast's mouth is erupting from Dooku's fingers and from his hands. So it was an interesting kind of parallel there of, of also the, the very thing his family swore to, to defend and defeat, you know, ages ago, he is now bringing upon his own people. Yeah. The, uh, the, the whole lightning thing, we didn't, we haven't talked about that, but that, that was interesting too, because um, we didn't really explain how they got away from um, yeah, the cave, yeah. the cave. And it, it's in that moment when he was having all these visions, <clears throat> excuse me, Pardon me. In the moment when he was having all these visions, he had visions that he was using lightning. And after he comes snaps out of it, he still sees the lightning on his hands. Uh, and this becomes something that becomes very natural to him. Like where he, it's almost like he's got a gift for the force line. And of course, we get to see it um, in Attack of the Clones in uh, his fight with with Yoda and Obi Wan and and Qui Gon or sorry Obi Wan and Anakin. But um, yeah, it uh, this seems to be something that stems from the Terataka, I guess maybe I don't know. There's probably more there uh, than than we than we saw on the surface, but I, I did like the fact that they were able to kind of give us some background that this was something that he wasn't just you know he picked up from Palpatine well before Palpatine was even around. He was you know dabbling in in this whole Force Lightning kind of bit. So but then we also see how Sereno became. The, the place that it is that we encounter it later on where they discover a new resource. They, they of course, now the Republic is interested in Sorrento. As soon as they start to get an idea that there's a valuable resource, they can help mine that will help you rebuild, we'll do whatever you want. Sure. And, and he shuts it. He said, Nope, we're going to do it themselves. He's going to take the mantle of count. He's going to unite the families or the, the ruling party or the ruling families or whatever that is. And we are going to take care of ourselves. And you get back to this very, you know, consolidated approach of, of just taking care of their own. And which is very much what we've always been, uh, what we've witnessed from the planet of Sereno. And then we start to maybe to flash forward a little bit towards how do we conclude Dooku's, <laughs> Dooku's arc here with Jenza. Yeah, this was, this is the part, like I said, that just, um, I don't know how I feel about this and maybe I just need to listen to it again. I've only listened to it twice, to be honest. Um, but this is a, it was, it was a little bit disjointed for me because, and it's real easy just to chalk it up with, well, you know, he's converted to the dark side and this is just part of it. And it becomes a lot easier to kill the people that you love. But it essentially what it boils down to is he's now in control of Sereno. 
he's now the uh, the apprentice, if not the would-be apprentice of uh, Palpatine. And he really just needs to start cutting all ties. And if anybody's, you know, it's, uh, if anybody's against him, uh, you're dead. Uh, and, and and the whole, we're going we're, to kind of pull it back to the original kind of uh, storyteller, which is Asajj Ventress. You know, she's on this mission to go find her. And at the very end of the book, she does and brings her to Dooku. Um, and it's all in that moment where he forces, I guess, I guess you could say he forces Ventress to make a decision about whether or not to uh, kill his sister because you really can't have any, you know, she knows about what's going on. She's, you know, his conscious, he doesn't want to hear anymore kind of thing. Uh, and so he forces her to kind of kill her and in, in which she does uh, Ventress kills his sister. And so it was a right of, it was a, a big moment for both Dooku and for her, but it seemed pretty easy for him to do this. And again, I'm, I'm maybe oversimplifying this or maybe I, I I missed something in here, but this is the part that I really had a hard time given what we had gotten for the last five, six hours of the the audiobook and how much he loved his sister, that he would go to the extent of killing her. It, if it seems like he at at a very least, I would have expected him to maybe lock her up or send her away or even just tell Palpatine, I'm sorry she's dead, but yet she's still alive kind of thing. It just I don't know. I'm not gonna say it was out of character. Um, but I, I don't feel like I, for me personally, I got enough to really kind of justify his actions in that moment that he would go that far and do something like right. that. Right. And to briefly put a little context around this, even when Ventress finds her and calls Dooku and he rushes to her when he gets there, you, you still have this, this arc of concern. He, he's, he, what have they done to you? He, he completely ignores Asajj and goes straight for his sister. So you still get that sense of caring and you're right. The story got very rushed all of a sudden. To where you kind of like with Anakin, a little bit Revenge of the Sith, although we saw it kind of building a little bit. This one didn't have that opportunity to build. There's a little bit of dialogue between them that that basically says that Jenza had planned to go talk with the Jedi about him. She knows about the hooded man. And of course, Ventress is like, hooded man? Yeah, hooded she, man. Right. She mm -hmm. starts to get curious about what that means, too. And then when that happens, you're right. It's like a light switch with Dooku. All of a sudden you have this cold, calculated person come back. And I think the way I interpreted this, and again, there probably could have been some time that this could have developed a little more uh, naturally. But as soon as he starts to hear how much she may or may not know, and now she's swearing up and down the entire time that she's not said anything to anybody and that she, everything is in strict confidence. But just to know that she would go to the Jedi knowing what he has become or is becoming is an absolute betrayal to him. And that simply cannot stand. You, yeah. there's, there's too much at stake in order for him to let that stand. And in order for him to, to grow, like he says, I must release you. And then he, he gives the command to Ventress and then she's got the choice to make. And Narek is in her head the entire time saying, this is, Don't you, do if you do this, yeah, if you do this, you're lost, you're, you're done. And she already knows that she, I mean, I, I kind of got the impression she already knew she was going to make her mind up before then. Then she had really no choice. If she doesn't do it, they're both dead. Yeah. There was a cool line there too, at the very end where he says, the past does not define you. The future does not define you. I do. Um, mm, yeah. And yeah. And it's right after that, that, you know, dark side doesn't really set you free very well, does it? Well, and that's the irony of this, right? And cause I think it ends with yep. Ventress saying, this is who I am. I am free. And like, man, that could not be far from the truth, uh, given what we know what's, what's about to happen. Um, so that's kind of sad in itself that that's where, you know, ultimately she ends up. Um, yeah, and, it, and I do want to apologize. We've, I was looking back at my notes here. We've got so much more that we didn't even cover, like Dooku killing the Teratoka, which I thought was kind of cool. But um, let's talk a little bit. Uh, we can talk about, well, let's. Yeah, we'll we're going to talk about Sifo-Dyas next week. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to dedicate, we're going to do a bit of a character dissection for Sifo-Dyas. So we will come back and talk a lot more about Sifo. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about here too. And there, we're, we're coming up in an hour and a half already. So we'll come back to that a little in the next show. Uh, but let's end with Ventress because we have touched on quite a bit of her, I guess now, uh, at least some of the bigger parts. But it was interesting that we got a, 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 a an origin that was similar to the original animated, the Terra what's the guy's name? Clone Wars. Yeah. Tarkovsky. Yeah. Tarkovsky's versions. Um, a little bit, 
closer to that where, you know, she was kind of like this, uh, well, she was like a slave and that she was fighting in the gladiatorial arena kind of thing. Um, did that, uh, was, did you, did that resonate with you? I guess, was it kind of cool to see that for you? I did. I liked it. I thought it was fine. It wasn't the exact same scene, which I think isn't a surprise when you take something that's effectively legends now yeah. that we got a little, I mean, and the, the primary difference between it was Dooku kills the arena master or the enslaver yeah. or whatever, whatever he was. And that kind of falls at her feet and then they fight because she's, she's pissed that he stole her kill. That was mm-hmm. hers to take. She'd been waiting for that. Yeah. 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 She was just biding her time. Right. But she got herself in that mess. So I, I like that. We've got that. We still have the, the story is still true from a certain point of view type of deal. Mm-hmm. So I was really happy that, that we didn't completely rewrite her backstory. I thought, I thought that made a lot of sense. And again, that gives you that hatred right off the bat for him that he stole something that was hers to take. So the ghost of Kynarik is a very interesting aspect in all of this, because throughout the novel, or I guess throughout the audiobook, you hear Ventress having these very long, very vivid, very real conversations with the ghosts of Kynarik. It's like a voice that's inside of her head. And throughout it, she's constantly denying the fact that he's there. You're just a voice. You're not really here. They they have these they banter back and forth. And he's like, well, if I'm not really here, then how do I know this or, and that kind of thing? Um, and so you're never really told whether or not that it, whether or not he's an actual force ghost or is he the consciousness of her, right? The good and the bad, the the good conscious, the good piece of it being uh, Kynaric and the evil devil on the shoulder, if you will, being somebody like Count Dooku uh, and the, the things that he's making her do. But I guess the question is whether or not you felt like, was he real? Is Was this the force ghost? Of kind art. This was really hard because there were times in there where you were like, okay, these are pretty general. These are things that she probably knows and may be suppressed or is just kind of coming out. But then yeah. there were other times you're like, I don't know if she would have known that. Some of the interaction right. with the other Jedi, there were a couple really small moments to where it really shaded that gray area, you know, pretty dark. It was really difficult to tell if it was real or not. Now, at the end of the day, I think I, I still, I, I think I land firmly that this was just her conscience. I don't mm-hmm. think this was Kynarik. I think this was her self doubt and her, her conscience and her spirit. And it was just manifesting itself as Kynarik because really who else would she have that would have listened, you know? And I think mm-hmm. what was interesting though about that was the dynamic of when, when Dooku starts getting involved at the very end, they have this kind of joint vision. The, the real war for her soul was, was finally underway and we start to question whether Narek's intents were always all that pure with Halstead and saving him and, and the scenario of his exile, whether or not that was actually real or, or what was, what were the actual scenarios of why he made that choice. And we're not really left with a clear indication of what was the actual scenario. So we've really clouded that part of her history to where she has to choose whether or not it, it really matters all that much because it seems like she really did truly uh, love Halstead for really lack of a better word, yeah. her former master, but was an enslaver, but treated her very well as we talked about before. And again, she clearly had a strong affi- affiliation for Narc as well. So it was, yeah, it was very confusing to try to figure out how real it was. And it did have some good moments though, but, and then the end just kind of complicated the whole thing. So, but I think it was still just her conscience. Yeah, I don't know where I sit on it. Um, to be honest, I there's at the very end of it, like the the way I was trying to rationalize how some of this stuff, like some of the stuff he knew. Uh, I think in one moment in the, in the audiobook, he mentions that he trained with Dooku, and that he and Dooku were like together and used to train. He knew him, that kind of thing. But I almost kind of you know chalk that up to well, maybe she was just so heavily involved in all this data research that these were stories that were coming up through her natural like studying and uh, investigation. And somehow they were manifesting into more memories, right? If you will. And there really weren't somebody talking to her. It's just, she was just so clouded and, and they were, they were coming out as, as though it was kind of arc. Right. That and he said, said, when he said a couple of times, I'm in there, we're all in there. Just look in the data pads. So he didn't right. have to answer the question. Sure. There's a uh, interesting at the very, very end of the novel, once he or once she kills uh, Jenza, 
um, she immediately does a check to see if Kai's there and he's gone at that point. It, there's like, there's, I don't know. I can't remember now if she actually says something to him or she's thinking about him, but it's almost like that presence completely disappears. And so you could argue that both ways. You could argue that, um, that he was never really there. And this, this choice that she made was the kind of final step to the dark side. And it was kind of a rebirth, if you will. And, and she, you know, there's no reason why he would be there or the fact that, you know, she, he was, uh, a force ghost. And because she had converted over to the dark side at that point completely, that, uh, there was no way that he could be in her head anymore. I think it would be pretty eye opening if if it was true that he was in her head, because it would be something that we've not seen before, right? Um, I mean, I guess we have. I'm not saying we haven't, but the fact that how would he have learned this, right? That's where I get caught up on is like, right. okay, well, who taught him this? Because as far as we know from from canon, Qui Gon Jinn was the first to to kind of relearn this thing. Although we think we it was probably out there what years past. Uh, long ago, but Qui-Gon Jinn was the first one who passed it on to, you know, Yoda and passed it on to Obi-Wan and passed it on to Luke kind of thing. So yeah, if I'm, if know. I'm honest with myself and with everyone out there, my personal bias has crept in of where I don't need it. I don't want another Jedi force ghost. <laughs> so I, maybe I swung that way because I just don't. And for the very reasons you had, you could argue during his exile that again, this is a penance, right? Mm-hmm. Your whole perspective, like we learned in the Vader comic, is to go and get clarity and to commune with the Force. So you could, there's an argument you could probably make with all of that. I just don't like it. <laughs> so this is my personal opinion, kind of creeping in. Of I just don't want. I don't think he had enough experience to get that far, and he wasn't in tune with the living Force like a Qui Gon was to where he would be able to learn that on his own. Again, we yeah. don't really know a lot about Kynaric, but just based on what we saw and his not as strong in the force as a Qui-Gon or someone else just again, kind of puts a lot of marks against him being able to do something like that. Right. All right. All right. So final question. Uh, and it's the first question I think I asked, but the purpose of this, this book, it, I just found it interesting that, that we would be doing an audio drama like this um, first off, and then we're doing it about Dooku I've mentioned to you guys or to you and probably in the last couple episodes that there is this, this audiobook is so steeped in old Republic references. And you can probably see where I'm going here. Um, a lot of references. There's a lot of lore. There's a lot of new stuff here that we've never heard about before. And they just throw it out there. I mean, we didn't even get into like the, the whole Harry Potter and the Boggan collection and all that stuff where they've got all these different relics and stuff. We didn't mention Momin. We probably should mention him. Uh, the moment mask came up in this one as well. But anyways, I just question why they decided to tell this particular story and why Dooku right here, right now. And I'm just wondering, is it because, uh, you know, it was a good story or is this setting up something for later? Is this a temperature gauge, uh, if you will, for what people's appetites are for this kind of lore and how, you know, what kind of interest it spurs to maybe go down the path of bringing in some kind of old Republic or, uh, you know, a, you know, a rebirth of the old Republic if they want to go revamp the whole thing or something like that. But I don't know. What was your, any thoughts around well, that? Quite honestly, I think it was, are people willing to accept this type of format of a book less mm-hmm. so than the story aspect, just the format? Are, are we ready to start welcoming back in a full cast audio drama? We've, we've had this before. We've had it with, the uh, old, the original Star Wars radio drama. We've also had it with some of the books, you know, the Ward Mantell books, and there's a couple others that, you know, had full cast. And are we at this point where we're ready and we want this type of thing? Is it going to perform well enough? Now, when you, when you take that lens and you say, okay, who am I, who do I need to tell this kind of story with? You, you pretty have to, you have to limit that pretty quickly to characters that are going to sell well. And I think Dooku was an interesting choice. And I, I kind of like the idea that it's Dooku because this is a character where we don't know a lot about him. And to tell the, to give us a really good idea of why he left and why he becomes part of this famed or infamous Lost 20 is a story that we've always been curious about. It's a story that we've always wanted to know. And to give that across Dooku's life, I think was an interesting way of, of doing that in introducing this type of format. So I think it's less, uh, yeah, it might be less, you know, character driven, things like that, and more 
how can I position this for maybe future ideas of this and how well is it going to sell? But I think this was a good story. I don't know what I'm trying to think what other story I would have liked to have heard with this that was realistic that we would get, right? We're not going to get like a Luke Skywalker type of thing, but I think this might open that door. Do we get a Luke Skywalker Ben solo adventure at some point? And could this be that format? Could this be a less expensive, quicker way of doing this type of exploration of characters that we don't have today? And again, it, you have flexibility and freedom with this type of content because it's not exposed to the masses. And I think that's a really cool opportunity that you have to do a little bit different things and then to tell these more niche stories that you don't necessarily have to go and spend a huge budget on to do television or do movies or something like that. Yeah. All right. Well, something to think about. I guess we'll see. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm okay if they do more of these. Um, we I'm just won't really review excited. them. <laughs> yeah. We just won't review. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. All right. Uh, we got anything else do we want to talk about um, before we get into shout outs and all that? No, I think, uh, I think we've, talk this one pretty good so far <laughs> all right all right well let's do um some quick shout outs yeah one real quick to my yeah, my buddy jamie uh we were exchanging some texts around master and apprentice he's listening to the show just want to give him a shout out say thanks appreciate it that was a, a fun conversation yeah thanks and i think we had um I, I should have marked this down i will come back and credit this uh we had some folks chime in i think on discord um, and even on social media saying that this was kind of one of the better episodes we've done, uh, recently. So thank you to those that said that I will get your names next time. I just thought about it right now. Um, so thanks for the feedback there. Um, uh, before we go, last thing we are doing swirl tour. So we've got the, uh, the guild, we've got, um, I don't know, maybe like eight or nine people now. And I think we're ready to kind of turn this into a social, uh, just more than just a social drinking hour. I think we'd like to really. I don't drink. They do. But uh, I think we'd like to just, you know, kind of start doing some more fun stuff like ops and all that. So if you play slow tour and you listen to this show and you want to come in and put us on your shoulders and carry us over the finish line, we'd really appreciate it because we have no clue what we're doing. But it's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's been great with uh, hanging out with Crowley and Kat and Steph and uh, Joe and yourself. Now we even got Jonesy in there. No Mike yet. Probably will never see Mike. That's OK. But uh, we're, we've been having a lot of fun. So if you guys are interested, let us know. Uh, we'd love to see you in the discord channel and certainly in game as part of the guild, or if you just want to help us out, if you're already in a guild and you want to help myself, Jonesy and the rest of the crew trying to make some progress in the game, we'd love to, to have your help. So just reach out to us and we'll put the stuff in discord and all, the links and all that as well. So, all right. Uh, we got any business. Yeah, to talk we do. About? The film appraisers had a really great episode with uh, Morgan McFly, who has been on the basement with you and, one of our favorites on the network. And they talked through the Willy Wonka, the 1971 Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, which of course is a classic family favorite with some really weird moments. And you want to tune in to get the, <laughs> to get Joe, Josh and Morgan's take on grandpa Joe and whether or not, yeah, whether or not he's a decent human being or not. <laughs> so it was a really fun episode and a, a great look back at a show that we all grew up with and have a lot of fond memories of. And of course, Gene Wilder is an amazing actor and yeah. really brought that character to life. So strongly uh, recommend that the film appraisers, you can find it on all your favorite podcast catchers as well as over at eargluemedia.com. All right. And that's going to do it for this week. Next week, we'll be back to talk about Sifo uh, because there's a lot to talk about now. Uh, he's, made his way into the forefront of characters. Okay. I'm probably overselling this, but <laughs> he is a, a more important character than he was just about a month ago. So we'll be back next week to talk about him and Jonesy. I foresee that this is going, this episode's coming to an end. Am I yeah, right? We're about to end this Al. Let's do it. All right. <laughs> Thanks Joe. See you next week. You're still listening. Wow. That's amazing. Well, I'm here to give you the disclaimer. Normally we do a big, long, drawn-out disclaimer thing saying what's what and who's what and all that other stuff, but I think you guys kind of know that Lucasfilm and Disney have uh, no affiliation with us at all, uh, and we have none with them. Uh, we talk about Star Wars, which is their property and all that other good, fun stuff, uh, but I think you can tell which is our stuff and which is their stuff. If you can't, well, then send a lawyer to send an email to me, and I'll be glad to chat with them. Other than that, you know what's what, so that's your disclaimer. 